I'm gonna get started. Uh, so, what, I, so before I get started, uh, I used to be a student here. Uh, I graduated in 2008, which is I guess a little while ago now, uh, but it doesn't really feel like it. But I'm here again, not talking as a federal government official, but someone that has political experience and has worked in the government or in, in kind of currently working in the government. And I want to talk to you about how the internet has democratized uh, political engagement and how it can make you, uh, or how it can enhance your ability to be a citizen in the United States. And the reason why I want to talk about this news is a lot of you guys are driving the changes uh, that we're seeing. And a lot of you guys are going to be affecting the way uh, political candidates, including the folks that are running for the President of the United States, on how they communicate to the public. So the rise of the internet and social media has significantly altered the way uh, high-level public officials communicate uh, to you guys, like I said before. And I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through uh, where we've been and then where we're going, and again, how you guys are going to see. So in previous, previous revolutions in communications like radio and TV, a lot of it uh, consolidated audiences for uh, public officials to uh, talk about you know, whatever was driving the agenda for the day. And uh, but what's interesting now is that the internet is individualizing content for you guys. And it's becoming a lot more difficult for political candidates to find a one-stop shop to convey their message. Huh. That's loud. Uh, I don't need it, but it's okay. Um, so it's individualizing a lot of content for you guys, and it's making things a lot more uh, difficult for folks who, if they have a policy initiative or if they want to make a change in the community, to go to one place and talk to the whole public. So I'll give you an example. So FDR, uh, one of the most, definitely one of the greatest presidents we've ever had, uh, would, because uh, he had served through the Great Depression and, and World War II, he would often uh, talk on the radio when the radio was just coming up, and he would reach tens of millions to 100 million people. And it was easy for him to talk to the entire nation about a lot of big things that were happening. The whole country was going through large amounts of unemployment. And then uh, we had started a war with the Japanese and Hitler. And it was easy for him to, to convey those points. So after a few years, you know, Kennedy was coming up. And um, again, it became a little bit easier for folks like him, who was a little bit slicker, a little bit smoother, to convey policy points on TV. And, uh, but the, the point remains the same, is that he was able to consolidate audiences, he was able to reach millions of people, and you could, uh, you know, a politician could basically reach lots of folks. Uh, and what's interesting about this, and what, what again changed the dynamic on TV, is that, uh, it, it put a lot more emphasis on the visual aspects of uh, communication. So when folks watch this debate, um, they thought, uh, on, when folks watch this debate on TV, they thought Kennedy won. And when folks that watched it uh, on the radio, they thought Nixon won. But uh, TV, again, uh, brought another place to consolidate on and the ability to have the visual. So again, if you're a political candidate, you can go back and you listen and you go out to the you know, old guard of folks and they would deliver your message. Uh, but a lot of that has changed and that's why I want to focus on that. So again, like, you know, you have Nixon who go to the press and he could reach lots of folks and he could talk about uh, you know, whatever he was working on. But again, that changes if, if, if you see that, same with uh, LBJ. But this is what I really want to focus on. How you guys have changed um, with your Twitters and Facebooks and I'm in the same generation how folks communicate. Um, and a lot of that what I'm going to talk to you about is personal experiences I had working for the president uh, and uh, even at the White House and, and then on the campaign and how that's drastically changed the way folks engage. So the internet has completely fragmented media. I'm going to be real with you, I don't even read an actual paper every day. I get all my news from online, and I will only pick up the paper to look sophisticated uh, at work. So I probably read more BuzzFeed than I do Wall Street News. And a lot of political candidates and, and elected officials have wised up to that. 
And a lot of things you'll do is you'll see now that you're going to see uh, Hillary Clinton, you'll see um, Marco Rubio, you'll see Jeb Bush. You're going to see him reach out to these non-traditional outlets to convey, convey their points. And I'll give you a story uh, about how, how important the, the media for education has been. When President Obama was running for office, uh, you know, when I was sitting in your seats not too long ago, you know, he would go to uh, the New York Times, he would do a lot of blogs and Washington and folks, uh, and he would basically talk to the traditional outlets, and folks would get the information that way. But now, uh, we have this whole thing where President Obama had an interview with BuzzFeed, did an interview with Vice, did an interview uh, with Fox, and the reason why we did that, that's where folks are. Folks will We'll even do interviews with The View, and that was unheard of many years ago. And the best example I can think of of, of reaching out to folks because of fragments of media, which I'll get to in a second, uh, was when the president uh, talked to Zach, Zach Galifianakis about the ACA. And I'll get to that in a second. But the point is, a lot of us are getting most of our news uh, from social media. And I'm going to be real, I get, most, uh, I get most of my news from Facebook. And a lot of times, when I found out Hillary Clinton was running for president, I found out because uh, I went on my Facebook and I saw a million people changing their Facebook profiles to Hillary. And um, my friend that's a journalist who works at a very esteemed publication, he says the first thing he fires up every day is Twitter. Um, so, we not only had there multiple media outlets outside of just the New York Times, CNN, CBS, NBC, um, but now there's people having uh, news delivered in their own individualized way. Um, and it's not like a paper boy come and drops the paper off uh, in your front office, in your, uh, the front of your house, and you go home and read it. But uh, like Mark Zuckerberg has kind of become like the global paper boy, uh, where we're getting a lot of our news from these sites. So this is, to be honest, the most ingenious way I've seen anybody convey uh, uh, a very important point uh, that's about policy, but did it in a way that actually truly engages the public where they are. So uh, I think this is in 2015. So in 2015, the president was rolling out the signature law, the Affordable Care Act. We need to rule millions of people for the first time and was a critical component of, of uh, enrolling all these folks uh, was ensuring that we get enough young people. And in previous times, you have the president go to a very esteemed uh, a news show, like CBS Face the Nation, and talk about you know, the importance of enrolling into the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but that was not the case. It was, we knew no one our age is going to watch CBS Face the Nation. People are going to watch the funny or die video that's on Zach Galifianakis that we're all going to share on Facebook. And then that's how I'm going to reach uh, 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 all these folks. And what's interesting is I'm going to show you how he makes this point um, with Zach. Why would you get the guy that created the Zoom to make your website? Healthcare that guy works a great guy. And millions of Americans have already gotten health insurance plans. And what we want is for people to know that you can get affordable health care. Most young Americans, right now, they're not covered. Uh, and the truth is, is that they can get coverage all for uh, what it costs you to pay your cell phone. Is this what they mean by drone? So the point is that a lot of young people, they think they're invincible. Did you say in, in, invincible? Because, uh, no, no, no. Because of the Not, no. You guys can't see it, but it's okay. Uh, I guess, I guess I can, I'll convey it to another point. Uh, this is, I guess, a story that happened when we were debating um, at Romney on how important social media was. So this is, I've actually never told this story. It's never been in the news, but it, it's something that happened. Um, it's informed a lot of our strategy. So we were going to our first debate uh, with Mitt Romney, and we were getting, we, we had a pretty good feeling we were not going to win. And um, 
campaign manager was going every single day. He said, you guys, him and Jim Messina, he swore a lot. Um, he said he, he just wore really raggedy clothes. He said, you guys, we're not going to have to win this game. Tell me right, we're not going to win this game. And he told us that today every single day. And the way we would uh, um, well, prepare is, well, for the debate was, we know where we're going, maybe we're going to lose. And um, just given the historic nature of a president going, uh, having the first debate league candidate. And the moment that we realized that we were not going to win um, was on Twitter. Normally, on normal presidential elections, you normally have to wait after until you have the, all the analysis. And you have some talking heads that will say, you know, X candidate has performed X, Y, Z, and has done this well and that well. And that will kind of inform people how folks did. But a lot of folks uh, were forming their own opinions and tweeting it out, and it kind of gained momentum. And we realized that from the first debate, and they carried that over to the second debate where we eventually won. And uh, it became very important that we won uh, the Twitter strategy, because that's where a lot of the opinions were being formed. And there's a side effect to having a lot of this individualized content on, uh, on, on media. And, and the gentleman from The Plain Dealer earlier kind of touched on this. Uh, you really uh, can stay in your own little borough of knowledge here. Like, I'll give you an example. My, I have a family member that loves Fox News. She's very conservative. She loves Fox News. And she will watch the show, then she'll subscribe to every conservative uh, news outlet, and then you'll have my dad, who's not much of a reader, but then will only watch MSNBC. And they're telling two different narratives, and you're really not getting any aha moments or seeing the other side to a lot of important arguments. And um, the, what has ended up becoming is a lot of people, because they don't really see other arguments, is that every president since kind of this fragmentation has happened has become more polarizing. You can see the shorter the line is, the least less polarizing the president is. So you can see how short the lines are to, if you look at Reagan, Bush, Clinton, Bush, and Obama, the line gets bigger and bigger and bigger to Obama being the most polarizing president uh, in modern history. And that is, that's not all due to media fragmentation, there's a pretty significant point to it. So a lot of these folks, in order to effectively communicate with the American public, these guys are going to have to know how to talk to you on Vine, on Twitter, on Instagram, on, fa on Facebook. There's going to be a Vine guy, I'll tell you that, on, on Hillary's race. Um, and they're going to have to know how to balance this new media reality. So how does this affect your life? How does, why is this even important? One, it's important that you know you guys are going to vote soon, or you guys are going to be learning about these elections, or you're going to have parents who are going to say you need to vote for X, Y, Z, and then I can't. And uh, but what's even more important is how these tools can enhance your ability uh, to participate in our democracy and, and become a citizen. So not just voting for the change that you want, but uh, truly being the change that you want. So these tools have emerged and allowed us to organize, consolidate, and deploy research more than any other uh, time in our history. So even putting together this event, I was talking to organizers yesterday, and uh, they use Google Hangouts, they use Google Docs, uh, they're sharing things, um, and, and if, if folks need, I'm sure if they need a fundraiser, they'd probably use a, 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 crowd, a crowdfunding site. Um, so the point is, is that a lot of these tools, as, as you're becoming a citizen, if you see that there's a problem, or that you feel that uh, there's an injustice that you want to solve, you more generally more than any other time in history have the tools to solve them. And the best example is the Arab Spring that utilized social media. Uh, a lot of these folks had, had uh, in the Middle East had been under very oppressive governments, and the only way that they have been able to communicate and organize fast enough to top a lot of these governments that happened in the last three or four years is largely because they're able to spread their ideas through Twitter. And there's studies that show that to be the case. A study from Washington University analyzed about 3 million tweets, uh, lots of YouTube content, and thousands of blogs. And the lead researcher from the study found that social networks and organized political action uh, was largely being driven by social media. So, the, my point is, before I get to these slides, is that you guys can do a lot of cool stuff with this stuff. If you feel like there's an injustice that, again, an injustice that needs, that needs to be solved, 
or we wanted to start an organization or a club in the school, you guys have tools to do that. And a lot of times that, uh, you know, it was a lot harder for folks to do it back then. And, but young folks were still able, about half the resources that you have, were still able to make a lot of change. So, like our founding fathers, James Monroe, Alexander Hamilton, were only 18 and 21. That's not much older than you guys. And they didn't have half the resources. Thomas Jefferson, I know 33 seems kind of old to you guys, but 33, he's only 33, he wrote the Declaration of Independence. He does not have half the education, half the knowledge, or half the tools that you have. Martin Luther King, also only about 33 years old when he had the Iron of Dreams Church and was organizing protests, organizing walks, organizing uh, uh, political action without half the tools. And you guys, with the knowledge and with uh, the tools that you guys can do a lot, not maybe not exactly the same thing, but you can solve problems. And Susan B. Anthony was a very important feminist, 31 years old. I guess the point is, you guys have uh, you definitely have the minds. You go to one of the best high schools in Ohio. You definitely have the tools. Uh, but it's really going to be up to your will and your grit uh, if you want to make change and you want to affect your communities uh, to do that. And a lot of these tools are changing the way you interact with your government because now you have more power, as the Arab Spring has shown you. But uh, you can also create a lot of change to your own community if you're willing to.